Thanks for listening to the Lake Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Susie Light. I get to share some stories and talk about our beautiful lakes with my friend, Dr. Nate Bosch. Nate, you received your degree in limnology from the University of Michigan. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right, Susie. Unlike oceanography, though, my PhD in limnology is the study of freshwater aquatic systems. On this podcast, we're going to dive into some lake science. We're going to meet folks who are passionate about our lakes, just like Susie and I are. And we're going to have some fun together as well. Visit lakes.grace.edu where you can learn more about the topics in this episode and support the Lilly Center's work. In today's episode, we have Tyler DeLauder. He's the district fisheries biologist with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. We're going to talk about how lake food chains work and specifically we're going to talk a lot about fish. We are so excited about today's episode. The doctor is in. Welcome to this episode. Tyler DeLauder, we are so excited to have you here today for our Lake Doctor podcast. Um, You are with the DNR. That stands for? Department of Natural Resources. Good. We (laughs) want to make sure everybody understands. Tyler, you're a biologist? Yes, I'm a fisheries biologist. I'm a district fisheries biologist. So there's six of them across the state, um, each carry, each uh, you know working on different areas. Um, I have about 15 counties that I've that I watch over. Oh my um, gosh! And all the lakes, rivers, and streams. Uh, you know, I kind of work with. We do is what we can with. Um, it's myself, and I have an assistant. Okay, so Kosciuszko County has over 101 lakes. Are we the county with the most lakes in your district? Kosciuszko and Noble are both my top are my top two. Okay. So I go all the way down to like Kokomo, um, Gas City area. So once you kind of get past the core reservoirs there, kind of in the Wabash, Huntington area, there's not a lot down there, especially any natural lakes, but some rivers and streams that we work on. But a lot of my work is in Kosciuszko, Noble, Whitley counties. So mm-hmm. how does one become a fishery biologist? Yeah. Um, so it was one of those things. I was going to school to be a teacher and... And I was playing basketball and one of my teammates had done an internship with the DNR and he was telling our coach in the front of the bus uh, that he was doing, he did this summer job where he was out on the lakes and he was, you know, netting fish. And I was like, I I need to talk to you later. Mm -hmm. So talked to him and saw he had done an internship with the DNR with a fisheries biologist. And so I went in the next day and switched my major to environmental science and got a, had my advisor at the time call in and got me a, 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 ch- a shot at an internship and I, you know I ended up doing that for four years in a row um, four summers when I was not in school so where'd you um, go to school uh, Manchester ah Manchester right yep. down the road from right. us yep right down the road tell us a bit more about you personally yeah so grew up you know fishing and camping and being outdoors and playing all sorts of sports I'll say I'm one of the rare ones that actually I'm still close to home I grew up mm-hmm. in DeKalb County and the St. Joe Butler area Um, And again, a lot of our people that work for us are from other states or California. I mean, so again, it's it's kind of rare to get find a job local. So I I, I feel lucky every day for that, that I got to stay close to family. And again, around the lakes that I grew up in fishing and in camping and that sort of thing. So does your wife and do your children share your love of fishing? My kids love to fish. My wife fishes a little bit. Uh, She she I think she does love it. She has to. Uh, We are engulfed in fish Mm -hmm. as we talked about. About. I, you know, I work with fish and then at home I have fish tanks. So we're kind of surrounded by fish. Uh, my kids do love to fish. We go, we have a pond on our, um, at, at our associate or in our property that we live on. And so we do a lot of fishing out there. So, so tell us, um, what is the DNR's role in helping keep our lakes healthy and clean? Yeah, so we do a few different things, and there's lots of departments within DNR. So there's Fish and Wildlife, there's Division of Water, there's just a lot of different sections. So we're with our my role is within the Fish and Wildlife, specifically fisheries. So I don't deal with wildlife, deer, or anything like that. So I'm specifically within fish, and our role is you know we are out monitoring situations, monitoring the lakes. Um, that may include surveys. 
Um, again, maybe that's the fish survey, maybe that's an aquatic vegetation survey, maybe that's us looking at the water quality as far as dissolved oxygen temperature profiles. Uh, so again, we have some different programs, projects. Um, so one of our big projects is called Status and Trends. So it's a standardized way of sampling. We The lakes are randomly chosen for us, so we're not biasing, hey, we're not going to this lake because we know it's got good bluegill, or we know, we're not going to this lake because we know there's a problem. So that project is designed for us to go ac across the landscape and kind of get a landscape look at, you know, how are our, all of our lakes doing as a whole? Um, and that's something that across the state we actually do. So all the other districts are doing that same thing. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good way to kind of see, you know, we always hear like, oh, the, the, the bluegill were bigger back, you know, I can remember the bluegill and the fishing being better back then. Um, by this way of sampling, we can actually look back at those and say like, well, actually we're seeing larger fish now than we did back then. Um, and again, depending on what species and stuff, mm -hmm. there's obviously some changes and, and it's hard for some folks individual lakes can be having a problem, you know, or, or be better than they were once were. But yeah, as a whole, we are kind of, we're, you know, we're seeing, especially with bass and bluegill, you know, we are seeing more and some bigger fish. So what kind of help or what kind of management would a DNR do for a lake? Yeah, so there's a few options. And again, first, the first thing you do is diagnose the problem, right? So mm -hmm. we go out, we're on the water, we do a survey. Again, it usually includes a, you know, a fish survey, a water quality survey. Okay. How do you do a fish survey? Yeah, no, you great can't, question. Like, take a clipboard <laughs> out sure. and say, no. "Okay, fish, are you good?" Yeah, <laughs> nope. I, I wish you could. That'd be quicker. Um, so, no, what we do is we we have some different gear that we use. So, it's like we use an electro fishing boat. Uh, most people have heard of that. A lot of people may have not seen it working or not, but it's a way for us to stun the fish. They float up to the top, and we we're able to net those fish put them in a tub and then we go back and we in 15 20 minutes segments we'll go back and we'll measure those fish um, identify the fish sometimes we take aging structures off of them so we can take a scale um, that way we can tell how they're growing um, so again you might be able to find a lake that has a lot of small bass in it for an example and you may take an aging structure and look at that and be like wow they're they're not growing like they're supposed to be they're stunted out so again that's where the dnr can you know potentially look to change regulations or we can come in and try to make some management decisions that would maybe improve that hmm. so i imagine there are a lot of different varieties of fish in a lake for sure and that probably is better for a lake to have different varieties for sure yeah we always want to see diversity you always want to see lots of lots of different species again if you've got a body of water where you're only finding you know a, a couple again we want to figure out maybe why that is again we always like diversity and that's with that's with not only the fish but that's aquatic plants that's you know just the habitat around again we don't want it all to be one solid you know all one type of plant one species yeah, yeah. so our lakes are all different in Kosciuszko County, and we've got some shallower lakes like Palestine, deeper lakes like Tippy. Do, do fish, do different fish live in different kinds of lake environments? For sure, yeah. There's we have what we kind of call cool cold water species, and then warm water species. So some cool water examples would be like northern pike, um, walleye. So they prefer a little bit colder water. So that a species like that may not do well in a Palestine lake, where again the water's really warm and shallow. Um, and again, the warm water species are your bass, bluegill. Those are the ones people are probably most familiar with most of the time. Um, they're pretty adaptable. They can they do well in Tippy and some of the deeper lakes, but also can again live in the Palestines and some of those smaller warmer lakes. Nate, I know fish are important to the lakes. Um, yeah. They're part of the food web. Right. Talk to us a bit about, about the food chain for fish. In nature, when we look at ecological systems, diversity is always going to be better. Ah. It's, it's better in, in our human communities. It's better in our plant and animal communities as well, because each has a different role to play and they all bring different values. And so when you have a great diversity in plants, each of them are, are uh, serving in a different niche. Uh, same thing with all of those different animals, the different types of fish. And so we're always going to have a better functioning aquatic ecosystem when we have better diversity in that ecosystem. And that feeds right into the food chain. So the food chain is, uh, think of it as, as different links and who eats who in the <laughs> lake, right? And so as Tyler's been talking about, he's thrown out a couple fish names already. Bass would be one. And so Good let's eating. start there. Good eating fish. So a bass is the top of the food chain. I guess there could be an eagle or an osprey, which would eat the bass. Or but, a person. Or a person, yes. Person. Okay. But, but in the lake, the top would be uh, a, a fish like a bass. Um, that's 
that's we call those piscivores, Pisces meaning fish, and then vor eating, so fish that eat other fish, piscivore. Okay. Um, piscivorous fish, those would be northern pike and bass, those sort of top musky, those top predator fish. And then we move to the next layer of fish down, a little bit smaller, those would be like the bluegill that Tyler was mentioning, yellow perch would be an example, a lot of the different sunfish. And um, those are called planktivorous fish. Because so, they eat plankton. Plankton. Oh. So that's now the next link <laughs> down, right? And so now we've got the zooplankton. Those are our tiniest animals in the lake. Little little things that some people call daphnia, water fleas, for example, cyclops, little rotifers. Do you need a microscope to you see do. those? You do. You need a microscope to see those. Um, you, can, you can, if you hold up a glass of water in the sunshine out on a lake, um, and it's literally glass or clear plastic that you can see through it, and you hold it up to the sun, you can see little specks that are kind of moving mm -hmm. and kind of jerky movements. Those are zooplankton. So you can see the little specks without a microscope, but to see any detail, you need a microscope. All right, so we have piscivores, planktivores, zooplankton, and then they eat phytoplankton. That's our algae in the lakes, okay? And so the zooplankton are filter feeders. They're eating the algae. Um, herbivores uh, eating eating the algae and then the algae need uh, nutrients in order to grow and so as you have more nutrients you have more algae and uh, if you have an overabundance it can actually start to mess up the food chain in those upper levels or if you have toxic blue green algae yes the toxic blue green algae is not so good for those upper layers because they don't really want to eat eat that uh, eat that algae with the toxins in it so we talked about people eating fish. Tyler, where are good places to fish in our community? Yeah, yeah. again, there's there's a lot of good lakes in Kosciuszko County, like you mentioned. Uh, so again, people, again, Wallace Sea is popular. Again, if you want to be out there with a lot of people and some of the bigger lakes and also some some of the smaller you know properties as well. Um, again, right now, I think uh, all of Kosciuszko County, you can go out and get, find bluegill and some other species, crappie, perch, or some of the more common um, and popular ones. Walleye is another one that's pretty popular to eat. Um, again, those are the walleye would be one that we stock um, mostly. They're not going to be found there naturally, so that's probably a part of a stocking program um, that that lake's a part of. If I wanted to know what fish were safe to eat as a fisherman, fisherwoman, uh, where would I go for that information? Yeah, no, that's a great question, um, and that's a question that we get all the time. And again, it's there's there's places on our website um, as well as the health department's website, and I believe even you mentioned it's on the the Grace's website, or yeah, the Lily the, Center's website. The Lily Center website has yeah. fish consumption advisories for each of our each of our lakes. There. Yep, and each lake is um, our role in that. Um, IDEM and the Department of Health are the ones that actually set those uh, rulings. We'll actually help them when we're doing our surveys. We'll help them collect fish, and so that they can take different species, different sizes of fish, and they actually take those back to a lab and, and, and determine those guidelines. And just for example, Winona Lake, which is, which is close by to Grace College's campus, has a fish consumption advisory for mercury. And what the advisory reads is that it's fine to catch fish and to eat fish out of Winona Lake, but not more than one meal per week. So it wouldn't be advisable to go out there and fish every day and eat the fish and have that be your primary protein in your diet is fish from that lake. And then for pregnant or nursing mothers, it suggests no eating of fish from that particular lake. And those are updated how often, Tyler? It, um, it's every few years. They okay. have a like a, I think it's a three year cycle. They try to get okay. to everyone. And again, obviously there's lots of bodies of water. Um, so they, they have a plan and kind of schedule that they work through. My husband is of an age that he has a lifelong fishing license. Are there other regulations that we need to be paying attention to? So generally for Indiana, we have a pretty simple regulations as far as, you know, what size of fish you can keep. Um, I always tell folks that we have them on our website and it's also in a fishing regulation book. A lot of times you can find those anywhere you, a license would be sold. They're in, you know, Walmart and sporting goods stores and bait shops. Um, and it's always available on our website. Um, I always encourage folks to go on and make sure if you're going to fish a new body of water that you look up that regulation. There could be special regulations, um, but for the most part, it's pretty if you know the regulations statewide they're you know again there's there's obviously exceptions to that but generally they're all in there and they're all the same 
give an example yeah. of why so, an exception might be helpful to keep a certain lake. Correct. Yeah. Healthy. So like, let's say statewide largemouth bass have to be 14 inches or larger to keep, and you can only keep five of them. Um, now we have some lakes that have too many largemouth bass. They're stunted. There's lots of small ones. We may Im implement a regulation that's, uh, we call it a slot limit. So basically that would allow harvest of those smaller fish a, to let the anglers or whoever's out there fishing for them, you know, utilize those fish, take them home, eat them. And also it helps remove those fish that where it may actually help improve the size of the fish that are that are left out there in the lake. Are there other things you do to help improve the fish, fish population in a lake? Uh, so regulation is probably the is one of the main ones we try to use. Um, so we actually I was I mentioned earlier we or to you guys off off camera, but we had we actually have a project ongoing right now where we actually have stepped in with, as the DNR and are trying to take some of this bass out. We actually did uh, again. There's a lot of small bass. We did a survey the prior year and found that we had bass that were 13 inches long that were over 10 years old. Oh wow! Um, a bass at thir a bass at 10 years old should be 19 to 20 inches, not 13. So, so overpopulation, overpop stunted the growth. Correct. Yep. And it's most of the time when that happens, it's a lack of the food chain. Mm -hmm. There's there's not enough forage in there for those fish to continue to grow. So they kind of get stuck in that. And it's a lot of times it's in that eight to 12 and a half inch range, um, which is where this lake that we um, are out there working on currently is at. So we went out there and actually removed some of those fish and and uh, actually placed a tag in them and actually relocated them to another body of water to, that has a low density of bass. So hopeful that a priority one is we're going to improve the fishing at this one at the tri lakes and then b the secondary part of that is we're hoping to increase the number of bass at the um huntington reservoir so kind of two for one hopefully so and how do the native native fish in the lake and the new fish that you transplanted do they get along okay i, I we hope so we i think so the, so roush reservoir uh je roush reservoir there in huntington has a very low density of bass hmm. so just for so for on sampling just kind of of a comparison so when we were out doing the tri lakes project we were out there with our electro fishing boat and we usually base things on an hour so we were out there catching 220 bass per hour with our electro fishing boat for comparison when we surveyed roush before we moved or relocated any of the fish there we were only getting about 12 fish to 15 fish Ooh, per hour wow. so a v vastly different um, yeah. bass community density out there so kind of like a robin hood mentality steal from the rich give to the a poor, little bit so. yeah again there's definitely an abundance um and again it's not something that we've we we do unless there's an issue um and again again when you've when you've got fish that are 13 inches long and they're 10 years old like you know there's an obvious issue out there mm -hmm. um and that was actually something that anglers and lake residents approached us with again people that had lived out there lake residents that have lived out there for years you know were tired of catching these small bass and contacted us you know a few years ago on what could we do what could be the potential um, again, us removing them is kind of a controlled, we'll call it a research project. We're trying to see if we can make a difference. Um, we also will probably pursue a, a regulation change that would allow anglers and lake residents themselves to remove those fish as well in those smaller size ranges. So a couple of different ways that we might step in and try to help manage. You know, I hear something really in common between what the DNR does and what the Lilly Center does, and that is research. Mm -hmm. So, Nate, what kind of stuff do you do about fish habitat? Yeah, so we've been tracking fish habitat. One of the ways that we do that is looking at dissolved oxygen in the water, right? Because those top three layers of the food chain we talked about, those animals all need to breathe oxygen out of the water. And so oxygen is going to be important for where those fish are found in the water column. And the way our, our lakes are working with an overabundance of the, the plants, both the algae and the aquatic macrophytes, the weeds, they die decompose, the decomposition uses up oxygen, and so that bottom cold water layer in a lot of our lakes doesn't have enough oxygen to support fish nowadays. And so we track what, 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 uh, what depth of water can the fish survive in, and it's often right at what we call the thermocline, which is the, the transition between the warm, lighter water at the top 
in the cold, denser water down at the bottom. So that thermoclines often where fish will kind of hang out because they want to stay a little cool, but yet they've got to be able to breathe still so they can't go too deep in the water. And so as we track that depth of, of fish habitat over time, we hope that that will grow. And as we have less nutrients going into our lakes and we have less, um, less of that overproduction problem, we'll start to have oxygen that goes deeper into the water and that'll help some of those cool water fish, right? Sure. What, yes. what are some examples maybe of some of the cool or colder water fish? Yeah, so the cold water, one of the main cold water ones, and we're only down to six lakes right now, is the Cisco. Um, so that's one of our cold water species. And again, it's that's that loss of cold water with high oxygenated water that we're losing. And so we're, I think 20, 30 years ago, we had like 17 lakes or so, 20, around 20 lakes, and we're down to six lakes right now. So again, it's, and it's nothing we did. They've been recently, I think within the last few years, been listed as endangered. Um, they're pretty common as you go into North, you know, Michigan and kind of further North into Canada, um, but because we're just kind of on their edge. And again, as you mentioned, we're, some of our lakes are, again, we're warming and we're kind of losing that cold water, again, that cold water habitat. So we're, again, we're down to six lakes. Um, we're doing what we can to try to, again, it's a lot of watershed work it's testing it's mm -hmm. trying to you know limit the nutrients that are coming in and trying to basically hold on to that the, that that level of uh, high oxygenated water so both of your organizations do research tell me how do you partner together yeah, well, we do a lot of projects together, and Tyler can can chip in here as well. But I think I think about on the research side of things, we did some work on Starry Stonewort a few years back. We worked what is with Starry Stonewort. So Starry Stonewort is a plant, an invasive uh, exotic plant that's moved into some of our uh, lakes. It's actually an algae, but it looks like a weed. So it's a phytoplankton with the technical term, but it looks like an aquatic macrophyte. It looks like a rooted plant, but it's actually an algae. All little cells working together. Do fish eat it? No. Oh, no. so it is not a good thing to have in a lake. No, it, it is not. No, and right now there's no effective way to. There, there, lot, lots of money across the nation are putting in trying to. You know, universities are studying it, trying to figure out how can we get rid of it, how can we eradicate it, how can we again, what chemicals you, uh, can be used to get rid of it. Um, and right now, no one's no. They've got some. There, there's a way they call it kind of burning it down, mm -hmm. mowing it. Basically, mm -hmm. you can kind of it will top out in shallow water. You can kind of get it down back down to the to the to the bottom, but it it continues to grow back up. And we and, found that in the research study that we did together, already yeah. back a few years when it was first moving into the area, we tried to look at what different timings of herbicide treatment and uh, combinations and and what. But that that's exactly what we found is that that you can kind of burn it almost like mowing your lawn yep. you're kind of just getting it down a little bit so that boats can pass through but if i mow it do i need to take it out of the lake well that would that would be best if if you could actually rake it up out of the lake so now not only are you moving removing that exotic species out of that area of the lake but you're also pulling with it all the nutrients out of the lake as well alternatively if you just spray it with an herbicide you're going to just top kill that top part of it that those parts are going to decompose, give off nutrients again, and you're going to probably have regrowth, regrowth yep. of okay. that plant, or maybe some algae in the area are going to start to pull up those nutrients, and maybe you'll have an algae. It bloom. can spread via that fragmentation too, so that's kind of the tricky part with any mechanical removal of it. So if you break off a piece of it, or if a boat goes yes. through it and it breaks off and it starts floating away, if it lands somewhere on the shore where it's the habitat's right, the the bottom is correct, then now all of a sudden starries can start developing there and one of the big issues again it's it's it can be impairment it can be issues with that it actually but it chokes out native vegetation mm -hmm. so where you have a spot where again we mentioned diversity is key we have a spot where you know we've got five or six different species mixed up if starry comes in it can slowly kind of take that out now we've got just that monoculture of just starry now so we've lost all that and again it's it kind of does pillow a little bit but for the most part it's it's a blanket like it just grows across the bottom so where we might have had vertical plants coming up and some good structure um, and we now get this kind of this monoculture. And again, it, it can turn a good spot for fishing. Again, in a certain lake where it's like everyone knows this, or I get this phone call all the time. Well, I used to catch fish right here and now I can't. And it's, you kind of have a deeper conversation and it's like, oh, I think they found starry mm -hmm. in that area. And it's kind of changed that. So again, the fish, we get this too, like, oh, the fish, like the fish are still there, right? They've just relocated now. They've found a better area, right. better habitat. 
So um, if I'm uh, if I live on a lake and I identify that I I have some of that near my home, what do I do? Who do I call? Yeah, yeah. Usually, so, usually your lake association is the best. Correct. Start. You can you can get a hold of the DNR. Um, we have aquatic invasive biologists that that we have one biologist that pretty much is at his is his main focus. Um, we do have a LAIR program, which is the Lake and River Enhancement Program, which is kind of another branch of DNR. Um, they have some funding available, and depending on what watershed and where you're at, um, they can do help fund that. But again, anything like that, again, we'll say that for all aquatic plants, if you ever have questions on what you have, um, you can always send a picture to your district biologist, or again, we have different aquatic biologists that will usually help identify. Um, that's something we get calls a lot because Again, a lake resident can, there's a, you can do a little bit of treatment out in front of your house without a permit. Um, so if they do, they'll send us a picture of what vegetation they have and then we can give recommendations of like, hey, this is the right chemical. And again, so they're not dumping the wrong chemical yeah. and well, I, you know, it didn't kill it. So I added more. It's like, nope, like, make sure you are using the right stuff for the right plant. Um, so yeah, pl any identification, and f that goes for fish as well. If you ever catch a fish and you don't know what it is, we have a, a spot on our website that actually you can submit a photo um, and it'll go right to a fisheries biologist and they can let you know exactly what species you have and what it is. And So um, often we hear that there's a fish kill on a lake. Uh, tell us about what should some what should somebody do if they observe a fish kill? Is it always a bad thing that there's a fish kill um so again probably i think most would agree obviously we don't ever want to see if you know fish dying if mm -hmm. uh, you know for like i can't or for reasons like that um but one thing is i always tell people is if you see fish you know if you see if dead fish on the water let somebody know mm -hmm. there's a there's a usually it's i honestly get a call and it's usually five days well i saw fish dying you know last weekend or something and at that time it's hard to really like if it was something a spill or something got in there it's probably too late to you know to get in there to actually you know get a water test and actually determine what it is now again there's always a scale to everything right sometimes i get a phone call for you know five fish it's like that's not, that doesn't concern me. I understand mm -hmm. why it may concern a lake resident because again, you're still seeing. Um, you know, typically in my mind, when you get to around 100 fish, that's when it starts. Okay, what what could be going on here? Um, now we've had some fish kills a few years ago. We had a fish kill that we were talking like 15 to 20 thousand fish. Um, so that's that's a big one. And again, mm -hmm. that's an extreme case. Um, but we do have a, um, a fish health team now that's within DNR. Um, so again, I encourage you, it's on our website to contact them so they can, they're, you're, you can reach out to them. So if there's a fish kill on a lake and you go in to investigate, you said, you mentioned testing the water, but do you do fish autopsies? So, yep, that's a great question. So a lot of times if, if we get that call, a fish kill comes in. So IDEM's actually, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management is actually the ones that are gonna go out and actually do the water sampling and everything. Our role in that is we have a contract with Purdue University and we actually, if we can collect fish in, in relatively, if they're either currently still dying or they have to be really fresh, we actually have a contract with them and we will collect fish and send out to Purdue to have an autopsy basically done. They'll test them for different things um, and kind of see if they can figure out, determine what the cause was. Sometimes it just comes back as it was a bacterial infection and you, you don't really get an answer. I always tell folks that it's it's nice to know if we can do, do, do determine mm -hmm. that, but it's also, it's not like we can, a lot of times it's, again, it's nice to know, but we can't go to the pharmacy and get, you know, medicine. I mean, mm -hmm. again, it's one no of those antibiotics for good those. to know, you want to know why, but yeah, it's not something that we can prevent a lot of times. Um, so, so if our listeners observe a fish kill, the answer their action should be to contact DNR right away? For, yeah, for sure. And again, like I said, if, if, it, if, again, if it's five fish, maybe not. If, if you're seeing fish, fresh fish over a couple of days and it's five fish here, five fish here, like for sure. Um, again, it's better to let us know and like we will kind of keep an eye on it. We have, you know, connections around or that we can say, hey, you know, if you guys see any more, let us mm -hmm. know. Um, but I always encourage people to let us know that, again, what's going on. We kind of keep notes and kind of make a file. Our health team keeps a, a log of every report that comes in. We've worked on a number of fish kills over the years in Cassiasco County with the DNR where either we'll get a call or they'll get a call and we'll kind of compare 
pair of notes. Maybe we'll head out and do some sampling. Oftentimes, if it's early in the spring, as ice is just coming out, it's due to a low oxygen event happening in the lake where the ice sort of sealed off the lake from oxygen being able to get down to the fish. Sometimes it's a particular severe winter, like gizzard shad is, sure. is a type of fish that we're right at the northern extent of their yeah. range. And so For if sure. we have a really rough winter, that's a fish that often will be susceptible to a kill then that we'll notice as the ice starts to melt off of our, yeah. some of our lakes. So a few other research projects, you're getting back to your question, Susie. So we also did some work with the DNR on public sewer systems. And so uh, we did some research on the Barbie Lake chain. It was slated to have a public sewer system put in. And we had a lot of folks suggest that, hey, you can do kind of a pre and post study. And so we linked up with the DNR because that's another question you guys get a lot around the state is, hey, should we add a public sewer system? And so we worked with the Lake and River Enhancement Program specifically at the DNR with some funding and, and uh, pooled our expertise together and did an extensive year-long study before the Barbie uh, chain got sewers. And then again, we waited three years after the project was done to let everything kind of settle back, get to a new steady state, and then did a, re, a retest then of that to get a sense of how, how sewers worked in that system. Um, we've done before you go on yeah. to the next one, if I wanted to see the results of those um, that research, where would I look? Yeah, so lakes.grace.edu, our, our Lilly Center website, we put all of our data, all of our uh, research reports are always there free and, and open to the public. And so both of those studies on Starry Stonewort as well as the public sewer system um, study were, are both, are both uh, put on there. An another project, uh, not research, but a, a, an important project for Kosciuszko County that we worked also with the DNR on is removing log jams from the Tippecanoe River. Oh, good. Um, so that, that we worked on a few years back. And again, we had some partners come to us, lake associations and the county. Um, and so we linked up with the DNR on removing uh, unnatural log jams, uh, a big stretch of the Tippy River, about 30 mile stretch of the Tippy River, removed over 300 log jams, uh, worked with Paddlers for Conservation that kind of extended the efforts with some volunteer uh, work to remove uh, some of those jams and we had contractors do some of them as well. Lots of local partners helped give funding towards that and uh, really helped open up the river, the river for paddling and more natural flow of the river uh, through our county. And is that important to fish in the river? Obviously, some part of habitat, some log jams, and that's why, again, it was to strategically go through. Yes. And, you know, you're, you're not removing everything, right? You don't want clear rivers. You want you want it to be accessible, mm -hmm. and you go through there and strategically remove the ones that are causing issues. We were with another DNR biologist yep. first um, to actually – pinpoint with GPS log jams and some of them we decided to leave alone. They're good habitat. Others, we only removed certain sections of the log jam to still leave some of the, the we call it woody debris, some of those those logs and branches up against the banks to help with erosion, with fish habitat. For sure. We've got a lot of aquariums at the Lilly Center as well, and that would be another partnership connection with the DNR that I'll mention. And so if you want to come into the Lilly Center and, and see um, bass and grass pickerel and uh, and bluegill and uh, mud puppies. Mud puppies. Yeah, we have Mabel <laughs> the mud puppy there, which which was uh, which was uh, helped from the DNR to get her and um, frogs and turtles and snake and uh, crappie in the tank, and perch, um, lot, lots of the different local native fish and those display aquariums are available for people to take a look at as well. Tyler, before we went on air, you mentioned something that really surprised me was that if somebody picks up a turtle to do something with, they, they need a fishing license to do that. Yeah, and we typically, again, for turtles and stuff like that, we typically recommend that they leave them be and leave kind of them leave be. them in their natural That's habitat. Right. Right. But in theory, yeah, for to, to do that, you would have to have a fishing license. If somebody wants to have fish in an aquarium in their home, or like at the Lilly Center, we have a special DNR license, which allows sure. us to catch fish in different ways. But normally someone has to follow 
the the regular fishing rules in order to capture a fish if they want to put it in an aquarium, right? Correct. Yep. So they have to follow all state regulations. So example, if someone wanted a little bass to put in their in a home tank or something, again, our state regulations are 14 inches. So they could not keep a, a little yeah. bass and take it from a lake and put it in. Now That's a you, big bass in your aquarium. Yeah, that would be a very, oh yeah, hopefully you have a big <laughs> aquarium for sure. So again, now again, private waters, so again, we don't have jurisdiction. So if you knew someone that had a pond or something that you could okay. take that fish and put it but yeah from any any removal of any fish for that reason or two for consumption would have again would have to follow our state regs mm -hmm. and those are available on your website right yep in our regulation cool. book yep tyler thank you so very much for joining us today this has really been exciting as yeah. a person who likes to fish i so appreciate your good work yes no thank you for having me i appreciate it and loved getting to talk to you and i'm sure we could probably do a, another one we've got all kinds of topics yes. and stuff we could yes. cover so good Thank you so much for joining us for today's podcast. Hi, I'm Anna. I work at the Lilly Center for Lakes and Streams. I'm team lead for our algae team, and I'm here with... Dr. Nate Bosch, the director of the Lilly Center for Lakes and Streams. Awesome. Um, today we are going to be doing uh, what is that zooplankton? Um, but what before we get into that, Dr. Bosch, can you explain to us our lake ecosystem, our food chains? Yeah, so food, food chains. So when we talk about a lake, one of the basic things we need to understand is how does the food chain work? Who eats who in one of our lakes? So as Anna said, we're gonna focus on zooplankton, which is the middle link of the food chain, but we need to understand what eats the zooplankton and what do the zooplankton eat for us to understand a lake. So let me quiz Anna a little bit here. So if we have zooplankton as the middle, what's gonna eat our zooplankton? Our planktivores. Planktivores, so our planktivorous fish. These are our small fish, bluegill, yellow perch, are gonna eat the zooplankton. And then if we go up one more link, what's gonna eat our small fish? Our piscivores. Our piscivorous fish, yes. Those are our big fish like largemouth bass, northern pike, even musky here in Kosciuszko County in Indiana. So we've got big fish eating little fish, eating zooplankton. And what are the zooplankton eating? Phytoplankton. Yes, phytoplankton, <laughs> which are also known as algae. And then uh, what are they using to live? All of the nutrients in All our the lake. All the nutrients mm -hmm. from the lakes. Yes. So that's our lake food chain. All right. Thank you so much for explaining our lake food chain to us. Um, now we're going to get into uh, name that zooplankton. Are you ready? Yes. Um, so can you name the zooplankton for us? All right, so this first one that we're doing, this is Bosmina. It's one of the Cladocerans. It's got Daphnia also in that same group. We can tell this one's Bosmina because it's got a long snout off the front of it. You can see its eye spot. You actually see some algae through its digestive system. So this one is known as Bosmina. Perfect, thank you. What about, can you name the zooplankton? All right, so this next one, it's got a single eye spot, and so it's named Cyclops. Those of you comic book fans out there will catch that reference. And uh, this one has got its tail coming off the back, which we can use to help identify what particular type this is. Also, the length of its antenna are also helpful in identification to distinguish uh, the cyclopoids from the colonoids, a couple different classes of, gotcha. of things like this. Very cool. Can you name this zooplankton? All right, so this one, the cover slip on the slide squished it a little bit, but we can still tell that it's a rotifer. Mm -hmm. We probably can't tell which genus or species here because of how it's preserved. But rotifers are really cool because rotifers create a vortex of water within their body. And so if you think of like a little tornado of water with little algal cells in it going through, and that's how these uh, rotifers are going to eat, how they do their filter feeding in our lakes. So we've looked at a few examples of zooplankton here. Remember, zooplankton are the middle link of the food chain in our lakes. And so we have the top link is our piscivorous fish, so our big predatory fish. They're eating our planktivorous fish, those smaller fish. Those are eating our zooplankton, which we've talked about here. Zooplankton are eating our phytoplankton, also known as algae. And then the algae, those phytoplankton, they are feeding off nutrients in our lakes. And that's what makes the food chain in our lakes. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Lake Doctor Podcast. Join us next time. It's bound to be fun. Listening to this podcast is just the first step to making your lake cleaner and healthier. Visit lakes.grace.edu for more information about our applied research and discover some tangible ways you can make a difference on your lake. We'll see you next time the doctor is in.